Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for coming here. Uh, and it, it's wonderful to see a, a beautiful new bookshop and a beautiful new room here devoted to talking about books. And what a, what a perfect uh, venue to come and participate in, in Book City. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And, and thank you for coming out on a Friday evening when you know, there's wine to be drunk and parties to go to. And instead, we're here talking about ideas. So it means a lot to me. So I'm not going to talk directly about my book, 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy. Um, if you find it interesting, please buy uh, copies and buy copies for all your friends and a great Christmas present. Um, it's really a great book. Uh, but I wanted to say something that would appeal to people both who've read the book and, and who have not read the book. Um, and I wanted to talk about what I have learned while writing it. The book is an exploration of 50 different ideas and inventions that have had uh, interesting, unexpected, or, or outsized effects on the world around us. You, you can see some of them here, the battery, copyright, the barcode, the smartphone, the light bulb, the clock, the razor blade, and even the passport. Um, but as I wrote about these books and told the story, wrote about these um, ideas, told the stories of their inventors, I started to notice uh, lessons that came up. And in particular, I feel that we very often make mistakes when we think about technology. So that's what I want to talk about, what we get wrong when we think about technology. And I guess the first thing we get wrong could be typified in one of my favorite films, Blade Runner. Um, Blade Runner, of course, is a vision of a nightmarish future. It's set in 2019, Brexit year, uh, just saying. And this, as you will know if you watch Blade Runner, this looks like a woman, but this is not a woman. This is a robot. Her name is Rachel. She is a, a replicant, a kind of organic robot. She's so sophisticated that human beings cannot tell the difference between her and a human. They need special equipment. In fact, she's so sophisticated, even she doesn't know that she's a robot. And yet, when our hero, Rick Deckard, falls in love with this machine, because she's so seductive, she's so beguiling, what does he do? He asks her out on a date. And how does he ask her out on a date? Well, he goes to a bar, he takes money out of his pocket, and he puts it into a phone on the wall of a bar. Because that, in the 1980s, when Blade Runner was made, that is what a phone looks like. It has graffiti all over it. Okay, there's a video, sure. But a phone is a big box on a wall that you put money into. So there's some huge disconnect here between this incredibly sophisticated artificial intelligence and yet we're still imagining pay phones. And in fact, when you look at Los Angeles in Blade Runner, nothing really has changed. They have flying cars, they have killer robots, and nothing else, just a little bit of film noir. So the first mistake that we make about technology is that we focus only on the most sophisticated things, the most spectacular things. Then we miss everything else that's going on. So what's the second mistake we make? Oh, by the way, she, she says no, so she hangs up on him. Some things don't ever change. <laughs> the second mistake we make, well, I wanted to show you an old film, 50-year-old film from British television with a vision of the office of the future. Let's see if we can make this work. Nice people. Ah, my office. The perfect office. Perspex desk, no in tray, no out tray, no phone, no filing cabinets, no clutter. Quiet, cool, very efficient. I need never get out of this chair. That'll be nice. No distractions. 
Just me and the work, alone and efficient. Alone. I wonder if anybody wants me. Nobody to ask. Messages. Well, BJ39 will know. After all, it works for me. I don't even have to go to it. Much better than a human being. Tireless and efficient. Anything I want, it brings. They got everything wrong. Everything is wrong in this uh, film. So, there's no computer on his desk. The fact that he has a desk and a private office. The fact that the vision of the future is that your desk moves on wheels towards you. Everything is wrong. But everything is wrong, I think, in a very revealing way. Because if you watch this film, you know exactly what an office looked like, not in the future, but in the past. You know what an office looked like in 1967 when this film was made. There's a big room full of pretty women, and the women are all sitting at typewriters. Only here, the typewriters are gone and we have computers. The boss is still a man, the boss still has his own private office, and the boss doesn't seem to do any work. Nothing has changed. So this is the second big mistake we make about technology. We imagine that a new technology, like a computer, will just drop in to our old system, and nothing else changes. And actually, technology very rarely works like that. So those are the two big things. Let me give you some examples from the book about what I mean. And my favorite uh, technology in the book, well, I'll tell you in a moment what my favorite technology in the book was. Let me first show you a picture of a Gutenberg Bible. So when I was working on this book, these 50 great inventions, everybody said you must work on the Gutenberg Bible. You must include the, the Gutenberg printing press because the Gutenberg printing press, this is a truly revolutionary technology. And of course, here we are. It's Book City weekend. We are celebrating books. Of course, of course, the Gutenberg Bible, utterly transformative. But look again at this. And of course, you have the printing press but there's another invention at work here, and that invention is paper. And when you think about the Gutenberg Bible, it doesn't work without paper. Physically, you can print on animal skin, on parchment, but economically, it's too expensive, it doesn't work. And paper is the thing that makes printing possible. The interesting thing is, Nobody in Europe really wanted paper, really. They viewed it as a, a kind of trashy, dirty invention that had come from China and Arabia. And who wanted it? You know, it, was, it was nice to be able to make Bibles on expensive material. And of course, it was the Italians who realized, the Italian merchants realized, this stuff is useful. We can use it for contracts. We can use it for letters. We can use it for accounts. And then finally, of course, it spreads into being used for Bibles, for books. And it's only then that Gutenberg develops the printing press. So we've, we make the old mistake. We think about the complicated technology, the printing press, and we forget about the simple stuff, the paper, uh, paper. Because paper isn't complicated, but it can still change the world. And in fact, many inventions that change the world change the world because they are simple. Paper is not just for books. I mean, obviously, books are the most important example, but paper can be used to decorate our walls. Paper we use to make cardboard boxes out of. Paper has other very important uses that we would be inconvenienced without. And this is a technology that changed the world because it was simple and cheap. And in fact, there are lots of examples of this in the book. Um, solar power. You think about solar power. This is a graph of the cost of solar power. This is just the last seven years. This is not decades. This is a very short space of time. And the cost of solar power has come down and down and down. Why? Not because of a huge technological breakthrough, but because of simple innovations in how you put together solar panels, 
because of economies of scale, large factories in China that just make the stuff more cheaply. Basically, solar power is now cheap because we have used the techniques of IKEA to make solar panels. So we shouldn't underestimate the simple stuff, the, the power of these simple technologies to change the world. And my favorite example, the shipping container. A really simple, old-fashioned technology. You could have made shipping containers in 1850, but we didn't get them until about 1960. Uh, but they have transformed the entire world economy, more important than the WTO or the General Agreement on Tariffs of Trade, any of these trade agreements, was this technology for moving things around simply and cheaply and predictably. But the, the shipping container is also worth focusing on because it tells us something about our second mistake. Remember, the second mistake is we don't think about how systems change. We imagine that technology slots into some place and then nothing else changes. But the shipping container wouldn't have worked purely as an invention. The shipping container only worked because a whole system of logistics changed, including the barcode back there. And this is a very common phenomenon when we're thinking about technology. The classic example, the most interesting example to me, is how manufacturing changed in the late 19th century, or rather, how it didn't change. So this is a photograph of, of a factory, American factory, around 1890. And it's drawing power from these great drive shafts on the ceiling. And the power comes from the drive shafts down via drive belts to machines in front of uh, in front of each individual worker. And the power for the whole shaft is coming from a huge steam engine outside the factory. And in the 1890s, Thomas Edison, George Westinghouse, Nikola Tesla were developing electric motors. And at first, people would rip out the old steam engine and replace it with an electric motor, and nothing really would change. And the productivity gains were very disappointing. They realized, with an electric motor, you can make it small. Rather than one big motor, you can have 100 small ones. And then the small motors can be on people's desks. And when the small motors are on people's desks, you don't need these drive shafts and these belts. And that means you can hang cranes from the ceiling, or you can have windows in the ceiling. In fact, you can spread the whole factory out. It doesn't need to be all crammed in around the steam engine drive shaft. It can spread out. And you can make a production line where material moves from one worker to another to another because the flow of material is governed by the logic of production. Whereas with the steam engine, the flow of material was into the drive shaft, back away from the drive shaft, back into the drive shaft, very inefficient. And because every worker has an electric motor, workers can take more responsibility. So that means a different contract, different training, different education. And it was only by the 1920s that factory uh, operators had figured this out. Yes, the electric motor transformed American manufacturing and hugely increased productivity, but only after you changed the architecture, the design, the tools, the processes, the workers, the training, and the pay. Then, electricity really works. And it's just a very simple, powerful example of how technology changes us. Technology demands that we change. We change the way we interact with each other. We change the way our businesses work, our universities work, our societies work. Um, and the truly transformative technologies are the ones that invite society to change. So I, I want to leave you with a, a final thought about this. Um, when I look at technologies that are simple and under the radar and people aren't paying attention. And when I think about technologies that force us to change, and I think about technologies that may be threatening, 
At the moment, everybody seems to be worried about the robots taking our jobs. I'm not worried about the robots taking our jobs. I'm more worried about this. This is a technology called Jennifer. Jennifer is not this woman. Jennifer is the headset. So this woman works in a warehouse, and as she walks around the warehouse, Jennifer tells her where to walk, which shelves to go to, which shelf to look at, and then if she comes and there's an order for 13 copies of 50 things that made the modern economy, for example, Jennifer will not say, take 13 copies. Jennifer will say, take five copies. Take five copies off the shelf. Take five more copies, and then another five. Then take three copies. Because human beings lose count, but Jennifer can count. Jennifer knows where everything is, Jennifer can keep track. So why is this job not gone to a robot? Because this human worker has clever fingers and clever eyes. We need those, but we don't need her brain. We don't need her creativity just her eyes and her hands. So when I think about how technology shapes our societies, I am not worried about Rachel, the organic robot. I am worried about how we respond to Jennifer. Thank you very much for listening. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you.